Chapter One of Old Old Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Charlie Gray. Old Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. Chapter One Goody Two Shoes. In the latter part of the reign of Queen Bess there was an honest, industrious countryman named Meanwell, living upon a small farm which he held under Sir Peter Gripe, a very hard, covetous landlord, who was persuaded by one of his richer tenants, Hugh Grassball, as greedy as himself, to take away the lands held by Meanwell and other poor tenants, and let him have them to increase his own large farm. When Meanwell was thus cruelly turned out of his little farm, which had enabled him to support a wife and two young children, called Tommy and Marjorie, he tried in vain to find another cottage with land. Care and misfortune soon shortened his days, and his wife, not long after, followed him to the grave. On her deathbed she did not repine at her losses and sufferings, but humbly prayed that heaven would watch over and protect her helpless orphans when she should be taken from them. At her death these poor children were left in a sad plight, and as there were but few people in the village of Moldwell, where they lived, able to befriend them, they could get no regular meals, and had to make all sorts of shifts to keep themselves from starving. At times, indeed, they were obliged to put up with the wild fruits and berries that they picked from the hedges. They were also without proper clothes to keep them warm and as for shoes they had not even two pairs between them tommy who had to go about more than his sister had a pair to himself but little marjorie for a long time wore but one shoe these two children in all their trials never ceased to love each other dearly nor did they forget the good lessons which their kind mother had taught them and well did they deserve her anxious love and the earnest prayers she had offered up to heaven for their welfare they never murmured nor even thought of taking anything from their neighbors however hungry they might be but were always looking out for some sort of work although but little of it did they get but this hard lot really befell them for their good for without it how could their excellent qualities have been so well brought out and their praiseworthy conduct have become the talk of the village heaven indeed had heard their dying mother's prayers and had watched over and protected them through all their troubles relief was at hand and better things were in store for them it happened that mr goodall the worthy clergyman of the parish heard of their sad wandering sort of life for they were without a home and had generally to sleep in some barn or outhouse and so he sent for the two children and kindly offered to shelter them until they could get regular work to do immediately after this unlooked-for blessing had fallen upon them a gentleman of rank and wealth came from london on a visit at the parsonage and no sooner did he hear the story of the orphans than his heart warmed toward them and he resolved to be their friend the first thing he did was to order a pair of shoes to be made for marjorie and he also placed money in her hand to buy good and suitable clothes with but he did much more than this for tommy not only did he get clothes for him but he offered to take him to london if he would consent to go promising to put him in a way to do well by going abroad after he had acquired sufficient knowledge to fit him for such a step when the time arrived for her brother to start off with his generous friend marjorie was in great trouble and her eyes filling with tears they embraced each other over and over again but tommy in order to comfort his weeping sister promised he would not fail to come over to moldwell to see her when he should return from foreign countries after he was gone marjorie began to recover her usual cheerfulness she knew it was of no use to keep on crying but what helped greatly to put her into good spirits was the pleasure she took in her new shoes as soon as the old shoemaker brought them she put them on and ran at once to the clergyman's wife crying out with glee as she pointed to them two shoes ma'am see two shoes these words two shoes she kept on repeating to everybody she met and by this means came to be called for a long while after by the name of goody two shoes 
Now Marjorie was a thoughtful little girl, and after she had lived at the parsonage some time, she noticed more and more how good and wise the clergyman was, and she could only suppose that this was owing to his great learning. The poor girl then felt ashamed of her own ignorance, and was most anxious to learn how to read and write, although at that time, in distant country places, very little instruction was given to poor children. Mr. Goodall, however, when he found how desirous she was to improve herself in every way, kindly taught her what she most wished to know. As he was a clever man, he took care that she should not learn by rote, so, as she advanced, he made her think well over each lesson, and though this made her progress a little slower, she became, in good time, a better scholar than any of the children who went to the village school. As soon as she found that this was the case, she began to reflect that it was her duty to devote some of her spare time, with Mr. Goodall's permission, to the instruction of such poor children as could not go to school. After much thinking and contriving, she hit upon a simple but clever plan to get these ignorant children to attend to her teaching. She knew that the different letters of the alphabet were sufficient to spell every word, only that those used as capital letters were larger than the others. Now, as very few books were then printed, and they were scarcely ever to be seen in the hands of poor people, she thought she could get over the difficulty by cutting, with a good knife, out of several pieces of wood, six sets of capital letters like these. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. And then ten sets of these common letters. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. When, after much pains and trouble, she had finished all these wooden letters, she managed with some difficulty to borrow an old spelling book, and, with the help of this, she made her playmates set up the words she wished them to spell. Her usual way with them when she could get several of them together about her was this. Suppose the word to be spelled was pudding. She always chose words at first that sounded pleasantly to her little pupil's ears. One of the children, who were placed in a circle round her, brought the capital letter P from the large set. The next picked up U from the small set. The next two a D each, the next I, and so on until the whole word was spelled. Marjorie, in her simplicity, fancied that the first steps in knowledge ought to be as much like play as possible, and the result proved how right she was, for her little companions were always eager for this game, as they called it, and were very sorry if they were thrown out by picking up a wrong letter and had to play no more that morning. Before long, not only her poor pupils, but their ignorant parents too, were very thankful for the trouble she took in teaching her playfellows. And as it often happened, they could not be spared to be with her of a morning. She would then go round to their different cottages to teach them, carrying her wooden letters in a basket. On one of these occasions, the worthy clergyman asked a friend of his, a substantial yeoman named Roland, to accompany Marjorie in her rounds that he might judge as an eye-witness of the results of her teaching. This good man was much pleased with all he saw and heard, and, as he gave his opinion in writing to Mr. Goodall, we cannot do better than to make use of his own words. After setting out, Marjorie and I, we first came to Jerry Hodges, and no sooner had we tapped at the door than the cottager's wife came out, and when she saw Marjorie said, "'Oh, if it isn't little goody two-shoes, and I am right glad to see thee that I be, pray come in, and this good gentleman too, that ye may both see how well our Billy has learned his lessons.' The poor little fellow, I found, could not speak plain, but he had learned all his letters, and was quite able to pick them out and put them together in short words when asked to do so. The next place we visited was Widow Giles's who, to protect herself at night, kept a fierce-looking dog. And the moment Marjorie opened the gate, he began barking at a great rate. This called out his mistress, who scolded him sharply for daring to bark at Goody Two-Shoes. After quieting the noisy cur, she asked us in, and seemed very proud to show how clever her little Sally was in learning her lessons. Indeed, I found the child was very ready at spelling, and she pronounced the words clearly and correctly also. Then we called at Toby Cook's cottage, 
here a number of children were met together to play who all came round marjorie very fondly and begged her to set the game for them she then took out her wooden letters from her basket and asked the girl who was next to her what she was to have for dinner apple pie she answered and went to look for a capital a the next two produced a p each and so they went on until they had spelled apple pie complete other words were given by the children chiefly the names of things they liked and were used to such as bread milk beef etc which were for the most part spelled carefully very few mistakes having been made until the game was finished after this she set them the following lesson to get by heart he that will thrive must rise by five he that has thriven may lie till seven truth may be blamed but cannot be shamed tell me with whom you go and i'll tell you what you do a friend in need is a friend indeed love your friends who are true and your friends will love you marjorie next took me to see kitty sullen this little girl used to be very self-willed and vain because she could dress more finely than the poor cottagers children i was glad to see however that she paid attention to marjorie's good advice and i hear it generally reported that madge has done wonders by setting her an example of humility and kindness and that she has much softened her stubborn heart on our way homeward we saw a well-dressed gentleman sitting under a couple of great trees at the corner of the rookery he had a sort of crutch by him and seemed to be ailing but perhaps this was partly put on that he might try marjorie's wit for as soon as he saw us he called out to her to come near him and then said more in jest than in pain pray little maid can you tell me what i must do to get well yes good sir she replied readily go to bed when the rooks do and get up with them at morn earn as they do what you eat and then you will get health and keep it the gentleman seemed quite taken with the good sense of her reply and with her modest look too and begged her to accept a small silver coin as a token of his regard for her merit one day as marjorie was coming home from the next village she met with some wicked idle boys who had tied a young raven to a staff and were just about to make a victim of the poor thing by throwing stones at it she offered at once to buy the raven for a penny and this they agreed to she then brought him home to the parsonage and gave him the name of ralph and a fine bird he was madge soon taught him to speak several words and also to pick up letters and even to spell a word or two some years before margaret began to teach the poor cottagers children sir walter weldon a wealthy knight living in the neighbourhood had set up an elderly widow lady who had seen better days in a small school in the village of moldwell that she might teach the children of those who could afford to pay something toward it this gentlewoman whose name was gray was at length taken seriously ill and was no longer able to attend to her duties when sir walter heard of this he sent for mr goodall and asked him to look out for some one who would be able and willing to take mrs gray's place as the mistress of the school the worthy clergyman could not think of one so well qualified for the task as marjorie meanwell who though but young was grave beyond her years and was growing up to be a comely maiden and when he told his mind to the knight marjorie was chosen by the latter at once as the successor of poor mrs gray sir walter continued to be very good to the sick widow until she died which happened shortly afterward he likewise built a larger schoolhouse for marjorie's use this she needed for she would have all her old pupils without payment about her that liked to come to the school as well as the regular scholars belonging to it from this time no one called her goody two-shoes but generally mrs marjorie and she was more and more liked and respected by her neighbors soon after mrs marjorie had become mistress of the school she was lucky enough to save a dove from the hands of some cruel boys who were tormenting the poor creature and she called him tom in remembrance of her brother now far away and from whom she had heard no tidings ever since he left her but in those bygone days writing letters was not much practised and there was no such thing as a post-office to be seen anywhere tom learned to pick up a few letters 
but he was not so clever as her old favorite ralph and of course could not be taught to utter a single word about this time a lamb had lost its dam and its owner was about to have it killed when mrs marjorie heard of this she bought the gentle creature of him and brought it home thinking to please and benefit her pupils by putting such an example before them of going early to bed some neighbors finding how fond of such pets mrs marjorie was presented her with a nice playful little dog called jumper and also with a skylark now master ralph was a shrewd bird and a bit of a wag too and when will the lamb and carol the lark made their appearance the knowing fellow picked out the following verse to the great amusement of every one early to bed and early to rise is the way to be healthy wealthy and wise mrs marjorie was ever on the lookout to be useful to her neighbors knowing more than they did she was often able to give them good advice and to save them from losses which they were about to incur through their own ignorance many of these good folks depended much on their hay now a traveller coming from london had presented mrs marjorie with a new kind of instrument a rough-looking barometer very inferior to those now used by the help of which she could often guess correctly how the weather would be a day or two beforehand she made herself so useful indeed that they all came to her for advice and profited by it in often getting in their hay without damage while much of that in the neighbouring villages was spoiled this caused a great talk about the country and so provoked were the people of the distant villages at the better luck of the moldwell folks that they accused mrs marjorie of being a witch and sent old nicky noodle a numskull and a gossiping busybody to go and tax her with it and to scrape together whatever evidence he could against her when this wiseacre saw her at her school door with her raven on one shoulder and the dove on the other the lark on her hand and the lamb and little dog by her side the sight took his breath away for a time and he scampered off crying out a witch a witch a witch she laughed at the simpleton's folly and called him jocosely a conjurer for his pains but poor mrs marjorie did not know how much folly and wickedness there was in the world and she was greatly surprised to find that the half-witted nicky noodle had got a warrant against her at the meeting of the justices before whom she was summoned to appear many of her neighbors were present ready to speak up for her character if needful but it turned out that the charge made against her was nothing more than nicky's idle tale that she was a witch nowadays it seems strange that such a thing could be but in england at that period so fondly styled by some of the good old times many silly and wicked things were constantly being done especially by the rich and powerful against the poor such things as would not now be borne among such old blind follies was a common belief in witchcraft the practice of which was severely punishable by law and many a poor harmless old woman against whom her ignorant neighbors had a spite has been tortured even to death on the stupid charge of being a witch it happened that among the justices who met to hear this charge against mrs marjorie there was but one silly enough to think there was any ground for it his name was shallow and it was he who had granted the warrant but she soon silenced him when he kept repeating that she must be a witch to foretell the weather besides harboring many strange creatures about her after pointing to the friends who had come to speak for her character and her truth she said very calmly looking at this weak man full in the face i have never supposed that any one here could be so weak as to believe that there was any such thing as a witch but if i am a witch here is my charm she added laying her weather glass upon the table this it is alone that has helped me to know the state of the weather and as for my animal companions your worship even might profit as i have done by their good example my tender dove she continued is a pattern of true love my watchful raven of forethought my joyous lark of thankfulness my gentle lamb of innocence and my trusty dog of sagacity if it be witchcraft to have such teachers to remind me of my duties then indeed i am a witch please your worship at your service fortunately her patron sir walter weldon one of the justices present was well acquainted with the use of the new instrument when he had explained its nature to his foolish brother justice he turned the whole charge into ridicule and finished by giving mrs marjorie such a high character for knowledge prudence and charity that the bench of justices not only released her at once from the trumpery charge 
but gave her their public thanks for the good services she had done in their neighborhood. One of these gentlemen, Sir Edward Lovell, an intimate friend of Sir Walter's, conceived indeed so high an opinion of her virtues and abilities that having been lately left a widower he offered her very liberal terms if she would consent to come to his house take the management of it and educate his daughter also she respectfully declined this handsome offer for she thought it was her duty to continue teaching the children of the poor who but for her she feared would remain in ignorance Several months after this, Sir Edward fell ill and was for some time in a state of danger. He then repeated his request that Mrs. Marjorie would come to take charge of his house, now that he was quite unable to manage it, and look after his dear children. The thoughtful young woman then took counsel with her kind old friend, the clergyman, and by his advice she agreed to undertake the proposed employment until Sir Edward's restoration to health she completely won that gentleman's respect and admiration by her skill and tenderness in nursing him through the remainder of his illness and by the great care she took of his children all the members of his household loved her for her goodness by the time that sir edward fully regained his health he had become more and more attached to mrs marjorie he thought she could hardly be matched for propriety of conduct for good sense and for sweetness of temper and with all this he fancied too that she had not her equal anywhere for good looks it was not then to be wondered at that when she talked of going back to her school he should feel dull and melancholy nor that after due reflection he should offer her his hand in marriage we know already how modest and free from vanity and false pride mrs marjorie was this proposal therefore took her quite by surprise and so undeserving did she think herself of the honour intended her that at first she was inclined not to accept it but this her rich suitor would not hear of and as her true friends sir walter and mr goodall tried hard to persuade her to accept sir edward's hand telling her she would then be enabled to do many more good works than she had ever done before she at last yielded she had not at all objected because she did not like sir edward for she really loved and admired him as he deserved but only because she feared it was not her duty to leave her old humble friends to be a fine lady all things having been settled and the day fixed the great folks and others in the neighbourhood came in crowds to see the wedding for glad they were that one who had ever since she was a child been so deserving was to be thus rewarded just as the bride and bridegroom were about to enter the church their friends assembled outside were busily engaged in watching the progress of a horseman handsomely dressed and mounted and as gay in appearance as a courtier who was galloping up a distant slope leading to the church as eagerly as if he wanted to get there before the marriage should take place when all was in readiness for the holy ceremony to commence and the clergyman just going to open his book a strange gentleman richly dressed no other indeed than the horsemen who had been before noticed by the crowd rushed into the church calling out that they should stop the marriage all were astonished at this interruption particularly the couple about to be united each of whom the stranger immediately addressed apart during this parley bystanders were more and more surprised especially when they saw sir edward standing almost speechless and his bride crying and fainting away in the stranger's arms but this seeming grief was soon over and was presently converted into a flood of joy this gentleman so elegantly dressed proved to be no other than marjorie's brother our former acquaintance little tommy now mr meanwell just returned with great honour and profit from a distant foreign country as soon as the news reached him that his sister was going to be married he resolved to take horse from london where he then was and try to reach the spot in time to find out whether it was a suitable match for one so dear to him as marjorie was and to whom he was now able to give a fortune if she needed it all was soon explained and the loving couple were then returned to the altar and were married to the satisfaction of all present after her happy marriage lady lovell continued to practise all kinds of good she was not content in giving largely in the way of charity but she constantly went about visiting the poor cheering them up and helping them in their troubles and comforting them in sickness she took great pains in increasing and improving the school of which she had been the mistress and placed there a poor but worthy scholar and his wife to preside over it she lived happily with sir edward for many years and as her life had been regarded as the greatest blessing 
so her death was looked upon as the greatest calamity that had befallen the neighborhood for many years. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two Patty and Her Pitcher, or Kindness of Heart. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. Patty and Her Pitcher, or Kindness of Heart. Patty was the most charming little girl in her native village and so all the neighbors said such a character as this it is very difficult to obtain but when children do get it you may be sure they deserve it patty deserved it for she loved everybody and everything and in return she was rewarded by the love of all who knew her the pigeons flew down from their little house to coo around her the fowls fed from her hand the cat rolled over her feet and purred out her fondness, and even the steady old dog Bluff amused himself with the strangest antics and gambles whenever he could gain her attention. They all knew very well how kind and good she was, although they could not say so. She was also very industrious, for when quite a child she used to bustle about and do little things in the handiest manner and as for sewing she was the pattern child at the dame's school where her sampler was hung up in state that the other children should see what might be done by industry and care when she went to the spring that was near to dip her pitcher into its bright bubbling water she would warble out her sweet little ballads with a voice that took the attention of all who heard for her heart was full of joy and she could not restrain her gladness on one of her journeys to the spring happened the great extent of her life which i now sit down to write it will show very clearly that we should always be ready to do a kind action to any one for love and kindness shown to others always return tenfold to the giver as it did to her well then to begin the story as i have now told you all about patty and her goodness patty had filled her pitcher at the spring and was carrying it home and it was no trifle to carry when full when almost in sight of her cottage she saw a poor old woman sitting upon the trunk of a fallen tree as if fatigued after a long journey her face was as brown as a nut and covered with wrinkles and her eyes were dull and sunken on her back was tied a bundle heavy enough for a strong man to carry she turned her eyes upon patty as she approached and cast eager looks upon the sparkling water in the pitcher a draught from which she longed to ask for and trusting in the good-natured rosy face of patty she at last ventured to do so dear little child said she in a feeble voice let me cool my parched lips with a drink from your pitcher for i am very old and faint and weary to be sure mother and welcome said patty lifting it up so that the old woman might readily quench her thirst long and eagerly did the poor creature drink so long indeed that patty was really quite surprised thank you my darling heaven will reward you for your kindness to the poor and aged said the old woman oh you're quite welcome mother replied patty and again went on her way but she had not proceeded before she met a large dog who seemed to be bound on a long journey, for he was covered with dust, his eyes were red, and his parched tongue was hanging out of his mouth to catch the cool air. Poor fellow, said Patty. The dog turned round at her kind voice, and stopped to look at her. She held out her hand, and he came near her. She put down her pitcher to caress him, and then he tried to make his way to what his instinct told him was water she knew what the poor dog wanted and held the pitcher so that he could drink he lapped and lapped until she really began to think that he would never leave off at last he looked up to her face and licked her hand in gratitude then after two or three bounds to show her how refreshed he was he trotted on his way 
Soon after, she met a group of little children who had been gathering flowers and daisies and making posies with them. They had been scampering about the fields and were tired and thirsty, so Patty told them to put their little hands together and make cups of them. Then she filled these handy cups and made them drink. Will you please take this nosegay, they said, and offered her the prettiest one they had. Let me put it in your bosom myself, said the smallest one of the group. They stooped down while the grateful child fastened it with a pin in her frock. Each of them received a kiss, and then all ran off to pluck more pretty flowers. Patty looked into her pitcher and found that it was more than half empty so that she must have her journey over again, so it was of no use going home with such a drop as that. But then she saw some harebells growing by the dusty roadside, drooping for want of water, so she gave them the benefit of what was left in her pitcher, and the flowers seemed to love her for her kindness. Back she went, without one thought about her trouble, and soon gained the margin of the spring. She was just about to stoop and dip her pitcher, into its transparent depth, when she thought she saw something glistening beneath, which caused her to withdraw her hand. She watched and watched until she saw a sweet little face looking up at her, and presently there stood before her one of the most beautiful of fairies. She stood upon the water with the same ease as Patty stood on the land, and she was not really higher than the pitcher. So, Patty, said she, you see, she knew Patty. So you have come back again, my dear. Yes, madam, replied Patty, rather alarmed. Yes, madam, because I, I know all about it, said the fairy, stopping her. And because I know is the reason that you see me, for I am a friend only to the good and kind, and I come now to make you a very useful present. A present, said Patty, surprised and pleased. Yes and such a one as will be a lasting reward for your goodness of heart toward others, and your little care about yourself. You blush because you do not remember the many kind things that you have done, and I am the more pleased to see that you think I am giving you too much praise. You forget all those acts of kindness which are the ornament of your life, and this assures me of the pureness of your motives, for it is our duty to forget the good we do to others, and to remember only what they do for us. You have always done so, my dear little Patty. To reward you, I will place a spell upon your pitcher, which for the future shall always be full of water, or of milk, as you may wish it. It shall also be able to walk, and to speak whenever you may require it, and shall always be your firm friend in trouble. Trust to it and never give way to despair. If by any mishap it should be parted from you, it will easily, by its magic power, be able to find you, and be by your side as your adviser and protector. Do not be afraid to accept this at my hands, for I am one of the fairies who oppose all that is evil. You, by your goodness, have acquired the power of seeing me and hearing me speak. Whenever mortals are good enough, this power is given to them, and we appear and present them with some reward that only the virtuous deserve on this earth. So put your pitcher down by your side, Patty. Patty did as she was desired. Now look into it. Patty did so, and to her astonishment, beheld the bright water gradually rising until the pitcher was full to the brim. When she saw it was full, she was going to raise it, but found it too heavy for her strength. You need not trouble yourself to carry it, said the fairy, smiling. It will itself save you all further trouble of that kind. With that she touched it with her wand, and the pitcher raised itself upon two very well-shaped legs, made out of the same stone as the brown pitcher itself. As soon as it was firm on its feet, it made a very polite bow to Patty, as its future mistress. Now, Patty, said the fairy, follow your pitcher, and you cannot do wrong. As she finished speaking, she broke into thousands of sparkling drops, and mixed with the bubbling stream, 
which seemed to bear her away. Patty rubbed her eyes, in hope that she should wake from what really appeared a dream. She coughed aloud, then pinched herself, then ran up and down the lane, and at last she was convinced she was awake. But more than all, there stood the brown pitcher on his natty brown legs, waiting for orders what to do. "'Quite ready to start, mistress,' said a voice from the pitcher. Patty screwed up her courage and said, "'Come on, then, pitcher,' and set the example by starting off with a run. And did not the pitcher follow her in good earnest? Indeed, it ran so fast that it soon overtook her, and ran before her all the way home. But the most wonderful thing was, although it bounded along with long strides and high jumps over the roughest places in the lanes, it did not spill one single drop of water. This puzzled Patty, who, with her utmost care, could never avoid wetting her frock whenever she had tried to run with the pitcher even half full. "'What will the people think when we get into the village?' thought Patty, as she looked at her strange companion. "'I'm sure they will be frightened.' And what will my mother and father say when they see what I have brought home? Do not trouble yourself about that, said the pitcher, who seemed to hear her thoughts. Your parents will soon get accustomed to me, and be rather pleased when they discover my handiness, for you have yet to find out all the good things I can do. As he was speaking, they came to a very high and difficult style. Shall I help you over, said Patty, thinking of his short legs? Oh, dear, no, said the pitcher. See how little I require it. So saying, he skipped over the stile in the most graceful manner. As he did so, a dog that was passing popped his tail between his legs, and after two or three very weak barks, ran away in a dreadful fright. A man at the same time was approaching with a slow and pompous walk, for he was the squire of the village, who, upon perceiving the strange pitcher clear the stile in that miraculous manner, was overcome with wonder. But he soon moved pretty quickly when he saw the little legs speeding along toward him. He uttered one loud cry and fled. His hat flew one way, his gold-headed cane another, and his cloak flew up into the air like wings. He had not proceeded far before his legs failed him, and he lay kicking in a furze bush, roaring for help. Patty could not help laughing, but the pitcher, trotting on with the greatest unconcern, soon reached the cottage door where he rather astonished Patty's poor parents. When he entered, he sat himself quietly down in the corner where he had been always kept, so that nobody could see his legs. The neighbors, therefore, who had been alarmed by the squire's account of his fright, and only saw a pitcher like every one had at home, of course thought the old squire a little bit out of his mind. Patty was awakened next morning by hearing a noise below, as if someone were busy with the furniture. She heard the chairs pushed about, and presently the handle of a pail clinked down as plain as plain could be, so she put on part of her clothes and crept down. The noise still continuing, she peeped through the red curtains that were hung across the room to keep the wind away from their backs when they sat by the fireside, and there she saw not any thieves, but the pitcher. And what do you think it was doing? Why, mopping the red tiles of the floor, and very well did he handle the mop. And there was the pail full of water by his side, as if he had been a servant of all work all his life. And more wonderful still, there was the fire burning. We can fancy a pitcher of water washing the floor, but cannot imagine its doing anything with a fire except putting it out. But no, there had he lighted the fire and put the kettle on, which was just singing a most delightful song about the breakfast being nearly ready. "'Good morning, my good mistress,' said the pitcher, in no way put out. "'You need not trouble yourself to do anything but grow and improve yourself, for from henceforth you will have very little labor to do, as I am your very humble servant.' Was not Patty pleased, for she was growing a tall girl, and felt a great desire to improve herself with her books, which she had had very little time to do, as she had been so much occupied with her household duties. When Patty was left alone in the evening with the pitcher in the corner, she said how much she was obliged to him, and how much she wished to learn, but wanted to know what she was to do for books, as she had read the few she possessed a hundred times. Oh, that's very soon remedied, said the pitcher. 
for you have only to wish and i will yield as much milk as you please then you can make butter and cheese and go and sell it at the market town and buy as many books as you like and have plenty of money to spare for other purposes no sooner said than done patty set out all the pans she had and could borrow from her kind neighbors and as fast as they came the pitcher ran about and filled them so that she soon had plenty of cream for her butter and cheese she had only to ask and a good old neighbor lent her a churn which the pitcher soon found a pair of arms to turn and such butter was produced as had not been seen in the village for many a day was not patty pleased and were not her parents delighted the same old farmer lent her a horse and panniers and early in the morning she started for the market town the way to which the pitcher pointed out to her he did not go with her as he said the people of the town were not used to see brown pitchers so he should stop at home and look after the cheese patty proceeded on her way looking as happy and as handsome as the best farmer's daughter of them all so everybody in the market said where she sold all her butter so went on patty's success until she grew into a pretty neat young woman with her old parents living in comfort in one of the best cottages in the village everybody saying that she deserved her good fortune and not one single soul envying her you may guess she was happy indeed one evening she was standing in the garden feeding some of her pigeons when a handsomely dressed stranger approached at the gate who after admiring her for a short time took off his plumed hat in the most graceful manner and begged her to inform him the nearest way to the next town when she spoke the music of her voice and her charming modesty seemed to increase the admiration of the stranger he bowed and after a slight hesitation went on his way but that young stranger came again and again although he knew his way very well to and from the neighboring city at last she found that it was the way to her heart he was seeking for he told her parents that he was rich and wished to have a wife whom everybody spoke well of since his own wealth left him at liberty to choose for himself without a desire for any more the parents smiled as they looked upon the handsome suitor whom they did not think one bit too good for their dear patty and so in the course of a short time they were married great joy was in the village on the day of the wedding if the queen had visited the village there could not have been more gladness of heart all left off working and made holiday groups of people here and there talked of the kind actions patty had done the poor women spoke of the clothes she had made for them and said there never was such a good creature as patty some had received nice little dishes of cookery when they were ill many of the girls had been taught to sew and make garments and the little children had been taught to read the church was filled with people who loved her and wished to take one last fond look at her sweet face garlands of flowers were hung across the road with mottoes such as patty the good god bless our friend patty kind actions never die and when the married pair started from the church scores of old shoes were flung after them for good luck with such shouts and huzzas that the village never heard before but the stranger who had married patty took her home to a noble palace where his forefathers had reigned for many centuries as princes and the humble little patty found that her dear husband had made her a princess and surrounded her with all the luxuries and splendors of her high station did patty forget her humble home and her old friend the pitcher no she did not the pitcher was with her but her parents wished to remain in their peaceful home which their dear child had made so happy by her virtuous industry in the splendid state in which patty now lived the pitcher was as much her servant and benefactor as when he first assisted her in the humble cottage when the poor came to the palace gates he stood there and poured into their pitchers nourishing soup to support them and their families and they did not forget to bless the good princess for her kindly thoughts of those who needed her protection and charity so much and so the pitcher although not now called upon to work still continued in the name of his mistress to do good to all around but even the very best of us cannot escape from envious hearts and evil tongues and so it fell out to princess patty 
for we love to call her patty although she became a princess many of the wicked courtiers who envied her being loved by the people whispered slanders into the ears of the prince her husband who at last was weak enough to listen to them for they made him afraid by telling him that she was trying to bribe the people by her charities to rebel against the rightful prince and to place herself on the throne alone and also that evil spirits helped her and that the friendly pitcher was one of them alas for human weakness the prince at last was convinced by their arguments of her guilt and although his heart ached commanded her to be put into a dungeon in the very depths of the palace and left her there to mourn she did not mourn long for as night came on the pitcher opened her prison doors and aided her in her flight come said he return to your peaceful home and show your husband that it is his heart and not his kingdom that you covet he will be sorry for what he has done when he finds that he has lost you she followed the pitcher but they had not proceeded far in their flight when patty saw that they were pursued by a party of soldiers she screamed with alarm be not alarmed dearest princess said the pitcher i will stop these pursuers so saying he bent over the side of the rock and poured out a cataract of water into the valley through which they were coming the waters rolled in high waves and swept them from the path until it became like a large deep lake the soldiers swam to the nearest land glad to save their lives that night she slept beneath the humble roof of her parents their own dear patty early in the morning she was in her own beloved garden with the beautiful flowers and she tried to be happy and forget the past by being always at work and by making others happy but her thoughts would wander to the home of her husband and she grieved over his unkindness to her in return for her love to him and sometimes in the midst of her tears she would hope that some fortunate accident might remove the evil thought from his mind that had caused her so much grief the pitcher was always by her side and gave her comfort in her silent sorrow the news of patty's return to her home soon spread through the village and all came to see once more one whom they had learned to love so much she told them nothing of her husband's cruel conduct for she loved him too much to let them think he was unkind our friend patty they said has come to visit her parents we must make her a present many a talk they had about what the present should be at last they settled it and all the girls helped to make a beautiful piece of worsted work wrought with many bright colors, and spread on a handsome frame. The motto worked in it was, Kind actions to others bring happiness to ourselves. Little did they think how much grief was then in Patty's heart, but still the motto was true, as we shall see before we finish the story. Days and weeks rolled on, but no news reached her from her husband. Had he quite left her? or did he believe that she had been swept away by the torrent which had so nearly drowned his soldiers she hoped that it was so for then he might be mourning her as dead for surely he must have found long ere this that the wicked courtiers had spoken falsely one fine morning she had risen earlier than usual for her mind was restless and she could not sleep she walked into the pure air scented with the perfume of flowers and her fevered brow was refreshed with the cool breeze looking round she beheld her friend the pitcher trimming the flowers like an old gardener who knew his business good morning fair mistress mine said he you are up betimes for the sun has hardly climbed the distant mountains to peep into our valley but i am glad to see you so early afoot as you perceive that i am taking extra care with the garden for i expect visitors to-day visitors exclaimed patty with an inquiring look yes visitors said the pitcher from whose mouth issued a low chuckling laugh i can hear distinctly a footstep in the distance it comes this way listen it is now near enough for mortal ears to hear and so it was nearer and nearer it came presently the figure of a palmer appeared at the wicket gate he entered but when he beheld before him the figure of his long-lost patty he suddenly stopped and stood quite still like a statue of surprise it was indeed her husband the prince that is the visitor i expected said the pitcher 
he has believed you dead and has wandered to many places to assuage his grief at last he has dared to venture to this humble cottage that he might again see the spot where he first had the good fortune to meet you he hoped to console his unhappy mind and to atone for his crime by coming where everything would remind him of you and of your virtues and of the fault he has committed in believing that you were trying to get his riches and his kingdom when he himself was all your world all your riches all your enjoyment your being alive is the reward for his sincere repentance he finds you in your first humble sphere grieving for nothing but the loss of him hoping for nothing but the return of his love the prince rushed forward with a cry of delight and knelt at patty's feet the pitcher like a discreet friend placed her hand in his and then went on with his gardening leaving the long separated couple to themselves who quickly effected a reconciliation with each other patty's parents rejoiced in her newly found happiness yet felt a pang of regret when some days after the happy meeting the prince proposed that they should return to his kingdom and that he would send forward a message that his wife should make her entry in triumph the pitcher walked out of the cottage and joined the group prince said he spare yourself the trouble i am here to give my last service to my mistress i have rewarded her for the greatest of virtues self-denial and love for her fellow-creatures and the fairy who animated me now recalls me to her water palace behold as he ceased speaking jets of sparkling water rose high into the air from his mouth until a broad lake spread over the valley upon which was borne a gilded barge rowed by stout boatmen in the prince's livery it glided to their feet and they all stepped in the servants pulled with a good will into the midst of the stream still the fountain played from the pitcher's mouth till the stream was swollen into a mighty river down which they floated until they came in sight of their own castle standing high up on the rocks on the border of the current flags floated from the turrets and booming cannons sent forth their noisy welcome crowds of rejoicing vassals stood to receive their much-loved princess whose happy tears spoke for her to the hearts that knew so well how good she was the prince and princess lived happily many years over a thriving and contented people whose love and loyalty were the strongest bulwarks of their throne the benevolence of the princess and her charming courtesy and gentleness gained her the title of the gentle princess and she was pointed out as a model for the imitation of all the young princesses of the neighboring countries the happy pair were blessed with a numerous and beautiful family of sons and daughters to whom their mother would often relate the story of her early life for she was not ashamed to confess her former lowly station and humble parentage and much wonder and delight was always expressed by the younger children at her account of the magic picture and many were the wishes that it would again make its appearance but these wishes were not to be gratified the magic picture was seen no more but its history teaches all who read it that kindness to others brings happiness to ourselves End of chapter 2Chapter 3 Blanche and Rosalind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Old, Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. Blanche and Rosalind. In a pleasant village some miles from the metropolis, there lived a very good sort of woman who was much beloved by all her neighbors because she was always ready to assist every one who was in need she had received in her youth a better education than the inhabitants of the little village in which she dwelt and for this reason the poor people looked up to her with a degree of respect she was the widow of a very good man who when he died left her with two children they were very pretty girls the eldest on account of the fairness of her complexion was named blanche and the other rosalind because her cheeks were like roses and her lips like coral one day while goody hardy sat spinning at the door she saw a poor old woman going by leaning on a stick who had much ado to hobble along you seem very much tired dame said she to the old woman 
sit down here and rest yourself a little at the same time she bid her daughters fetch a chair they both went but rosalind ran fastest and brought one will you please to drink said goody hearty thank you answered the old woman i don't care if i do and methinks if you had anything nice that i liked i could eat a bit you are welcome to the best i have in my house said goody hearty but as i am poor it is homely fare she then ordered her daughters to spread a clean cloth on the table while she went to the cupboard from whence she took some brown bread and cheese to which she added a mug of cider as soon as the old woman was seated at the table goody hearty desired her eldest daughter to go and gather some plums off her own plum tree which she had planted herself and took great delight in blanche instead of obeying her mother readily grumbled and muttered as she went surely said she to herself i did not take all this care and pains with my plum tree for that old creature however she durst not refuse gathering a few plums but she gave them with a very ill will and very ungraciously as for you rosalind said her mother you have no fruit to offer this good dame for your grapes are not ripe that's true replied rosalind but my hen has just laid for i hear her cackle and if the lady likes a new-laid egg tis very much at her service and without staying for an answer she ran to the hen-roost and brought the egg but just as she was presenting it to the old woman she turned into a fine beautiful lady good woman said she to goody hearty i have long seen your industry perseverance and pious resignation and i will reward your daughters according to their merits the eldest shall be a great queen the other shall have a country farm with this she struck the house with her stick which immediately disappeared and in its room up came a pretty little snug farm this rosalind said she is your lot i know i have given each of you what you like best having said this the fairy went away leaving both mother and daughters greatly astonished they went into the farmhouse and were quite charmed with the neatness of the furniture the chairs were only wood but so bright you might see your face in them the beds were of linen cloth as white as snow there were forty sheep in the sheep pen four oxen and four cows in their stalls and in the yard all sorts of poultry hens ducks pigeons etc there was also a pretty garden well stocked with flowers fruit and vegetables blanche saw the fairy's gift to her sister without being jealous and was wholly taken up with the thoughts of being a queen when all of a sudden she heard some hunters riding by and going to the gate to see them she appeared so charming in the king's eyes who was there that he resolved to marry her when blanche was a queen she said to her sister rosalind i do not care you should be a farmer come with me sister and i will match you to some great lord i am very much obliged to you sister replied rosalind but i am used to a country life and i prefer to stay where i am queen blanche arrived at her palace and was so delighted with her new dignity that she could not sleep for several nights the first three months her thoughts were wholly engrossed by dress balls and plays so that she thought of nothing else she was soon accustomed to all this and nothing now diverted her on the contrary she found it a great deal of trouble the ladies of the court were all very respectful in her presence but she knew very well that they did not love her and when out of her sight would often say to one another see what airs this little country girl gives herself his majesty must have a very mean fancy to make choice of such a consort these discourses soon reached the king's ears and made him reflect on what he had done he began to think he was wrong and repented his marriage the courtiers saw this and accordingly paid little or no respect to blanche she was very unhappy for she had not a single friend to whom she could declare her griefs she saw it was the fashion at court to betray the dearest friend for interest to caress and smile upon those they most hated and to lie every instant she was obliged to be always serious because they told her a queen ought to look grave and majestic she had several children and all the time there was a physician to inspect whatever she ate or drank and to order everything she liked off the table not a grain of salt was allowed to be put in her soup nor was she permitted to take a walk though she wished ever so much to do so 
governesses were appointed to her children who brought them up contrary to her wishes yet she had not the liberty to find fault poor queen blanche was dying with grief and grew so thin that it was sad to see her she had not seen her sister for three years because she imagined it would disgrace a person of her rank and dignity to pay a visit to a farmer's wife her extreme melancholy made her very ill and her physicians ordered change of air she therefore resolved to spend a few days in the country to divert her uneasiness and improve her health accordingly she asked the king for leave to go and he very readily granted it because he thought he should be rid of her for some time she set out and soon arrived at the village as she drew near rosalind's house she beheld at a little distance from the door a company of shepherds and shepherdesses who were dancing and making merry alas said the queen sighing there once was a time when i used to divert myself like those poor people and no one found fault with me the moment rosalind perceived her sister she ran to embrace her the queen ordered her carriage to stop and alighting rushed into her sister's arms but rosalind was grown so plump and had such an air of content that the queen as she looked on her could not forbear bursting into tears rosalind was married to a farmer's son who had no fortune of his own but then he ever remembered that he was indebted to his wife for everything he had and he strove to show his gratitude by his obliging behaviour rosalind had not many servants but those she had loved her as though she had been their mother because she used them kindly she was beloved by all her neighbours and they all endeavoured to show it she neither had nor wanted much money corn wine and oil were the growth of her farm her cows supplied her with milk butter and cheese the wool of her sheep was spun to clothe herself her husband and her two children they enjoyed perfect health and when the work of the day was over they spent the evening in all sorts of pastimes alas cried the queen the fairy made me a sad present in giving me a crown content is not found in magnificent palaces but in an innocent country life scarce had she done speaking before the fairy appeared in making you a queen said the fairy i did not intend to reward but punish you for giving me your plums with all ill will to be contented and happy you must like your sister possess only what is necessary and wish for nothing else ah madam cried blanche you are sufficiently revenged pray put an end to my distress it is at an end said the fairy the king who loves you no longer has just married another wife and to-morrow his officers will come to forbid you returning any more to the palace it happened just as the fairy had foretold and blanche passed the remainder of her days with her sister rosalind in all manner of happiness and content and never thought again of the court unless it were to thank the fairy for having brought her back to her native village End of chapter 3chapter four fairer than a fairy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings on the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. the old old fairy tales by laura valentine fairer than a fairy there formerly reigned a king who having already had several children took it into his head to travel accompanied by his queen from one end of his dominions to the other accordingly the royal wanderers went by easy journeys from province to province making a short stay in each and after a time arrived at a noble castle situated on the frontiers of their kingdom where the queen gave birth to a daughter the little princess was so miraculously beautiful even at the moment of her birth that the courtiers for once sincere in their admirations of her charms called her fairer than a fairy and it will soon be manifest that she will deserve so illustrious a name as soon as the queen was able to quit her room she hastened from the castle to join her husband who had set off in haste some days before to defend a distant province which was threatened by his enemies the queen left the little fairer as we shall call her with the governess who brought up her young charge with great care and as her father had to sustain a long and cruel war 
the princess in retirement had leisure to improve both in mind and person her beauty became famous in all the neighboring kingdoms nothing else was spoken of and when she had completed with her twelfth year she looked more like a goddess than a mere mortal about this time one of her brothers left the army to visit her during a truce and the prince and princess formed an inviolable attachment meanwhile the renown of fairer's beauty and particularly her name had so irritated the fairies that they contrived a thousand schemes of vengeance against her to destroy a beauty that caused them so much jealousy the queen of the fairies in the neighbourhood was not one of those good fairies who are the protectresses of virtue and who take a pleasure in doing good she had at the end of many centuries at length attained the honour of royalty by her deep skill and knowledge but she was very small and on that account was called dwarfina accordingly dwarfina assembled her council and made it known that she was resolved to avenge an affront offered to all the handsome persons at her court and indeed to all the world adding that she intended to leave her palace for a time in order to visit and carry off this boasted fairer who had obtained a reputation so injurious to her charms no sooner had dwarfina made known this determination than she hastened to put it into execution and having dressed herself in a simple gown transported herself to the castle in which the object of her journey resided she soon made herself familiar there and by the charms of her conversation induced the princess's ladies to receive her among them but dwarfina was no less astonished than displeased when having carefully inspected and examined the castle she became aware by means of her art that it was built by a powerful magician and that there was attached to it in its gardens and terraces such a virtue as made it impossible to use any kind of spell or enchantment against its inmates fairer's governess was not intolerant of the circumstance although conscious of the invaluable treasure that had been committed to her charge she lived consequently in perfect security well knowing that one who can injure her precious pupil so long as she could keep within the castle in its gardens accordingly she had expressly forbidden her to quit the palace and fairer who was very prudent and obedient took care not to obey this injunction dwarfina took great pains to insinuate herself into the princess's good graces she taught her several fine kinds of needlework she amused her by relating the most amusing stories and neglected nothing that could tend to her delight until she succeeded so well in her design that the princess was soon never seen without the fairy the disguised queen amid all these cares never forgot her revenge but incessantly sought by stratagem to entrap fairer into stepping beyond the castle gates which was all that she wanted to enable her to carry the hated princess off one day they were in the castle garden when dwarfina opened a little door and having passed into the fields beyond she performed a thousand antic tricks to amuse the princess and her ladies but all at once pretending to be taken ill she fell as though she swooned the princess's attendants ran to her assistance and fairer herself in her anxiety forgot the cautions she had received and hastened to the spot but scarcely had the unfortunate princess passed the walls of the castle when dwarfina arose seized her rudely by the arm and making a circle around them and thick black cloud appeared which having cleared away the earth opened and from the chasm issued two moles with wings of rose leaves drawing an ebony chariot dwarfina seated herself therein pulling the princess after her when the chariot mounted into the air with incredible swiftness and soon disappeared to the young ladies who by their tears and cries made known to every one in the castle the loss they had sustained the rapidity with which the chariot rushed through the air made fairer so giddy that she became for some time almost insensible at last recovering herself she looked downward what was to her terror when she perceived immediately beneath her the vast extent of the fathomless ocean she uttered a piercing shriek and turned round when seeing her dear dwarfina she threw her arms round the fairy's neck and embraced her tenderly feeling somewhat tranquillized to find some one near her whom she loved but repulsing her rudely the fairy said away impertinent behold in me your mortal enemy i am the queen of the fairies and am now about to take you to suffer for the arrogance of those who dared to give you your presumptuous name fairer trembled when she heard these words as though a thunderbolt had fallen at her feet but was still more frightened at the terrible speed at which they were travelling after a while the chariot descended into the midst of a magnificent quadrangle of the most superb palace ever beheld 
the sight of so charming a place a little reassured the timid princess especially when on alighting from the chariot she beheld a hundred beautiful young ladies who hastened courteously to welcome the fairy so charming an abode did not seem to threaten misfortune and fairer received consolation which could not fail to soothe any lady in her great distress when she remarked that all the young beauties were struck with admiration at beholding her and heard a confused murmur of praise and envy of her charms all which naturally pleased her alas how short are all human pleasures especially those arising from vanity Rafina imperiously gave orders to her attendants to strip fairer of her fine clothes expecting thus to deprive her of a portion of her charms this was quickly effected but dwarfina's rage only increased what new beauties disclosed themselves what confusion for all the fairies present they dressed her in rags but her simple and natural beauty triumphed over the costly clothes and jewels which surrounded her and never did she appear more beautiful dwarfina therefore gave orders for her to be taken away and ordered the tasks which she had allotted to be given to her at once thereupon two fairies laid hold of the princess and obliged her to accompany them through the most sumptuous apartments that were ever seen fairer contemplated them complacently and notwithstanding her present situation she said to herself whatever torments they may prepare for me my heart whispers that i shall not always be miserable in this charming abode presently they came to a broad black marble staircase of upward of a thousand steps which the fairies made fairer descend it was so long that the princess thought she must be going to the abyss under the earth at last she arrived at a small cell wainscoted with ebony where her companions informed her that she must sleep on a little straw which lay in one corner while in another stood an ounce of bread and a mug of water for her supper thence the princess was led into a long gallery of which the walls from the ceiling to the floor were also of black marble in which were lighted by the feeble rays of five jet lamps which shed a sombre and most gloomy light rather calculated to inspire terror than comfort these sorrowful walls were thickly covered from top to bottom with a complete network of spiders webs which had the singular property of multiplying the more they were swept away the two fairies then told the princess that if she did not cleanse the walls of that gallery by daybreak next morning she would undergo a most terrible punishment they finally placed a ladder against the wall and putting a cane broom into her hands desired her to work away and quitted the gallery fairer unacquainted with the fatality of the spider's webs although the gallery was very long heroically resolved to do her best so taking the broom she stepped lightly up the ladder alas alas what was her astonishment when endeavouring to clear the marble of the webs she found that they were only augmented she wearied herself with exertion but finding that it was all in vain she threw down her broom descended from the ladder and seating herself on the lowest step burst into tears lamenting her cruel fate her sobs were so deep and so numerous that they quite exhausted her strength and she was on the point of fouling on the marble pavement when her eyes encountered a strong glare of light the whole length of the gallery became instantly illuminated and fairer saw kneeling before her a young man of such handsome features and figure that had it not been for his dress she would have taken him for cupid himself she was doubtful whether all this light did not proceed from the young stranger's eyes so sparkling and brilliant did they appear to her the young man continued to regard her attentively without rising at last fairer said to him in astonishment who are you gallant stranger are you a god are you the god of love i am not a god answered the youth but i have more love in my heart than there is in the whole world besides i am pyrrho son of the queen of fairies and am in love with you and come to your assistance with that pyrrho picked up the broom which fairer had thrown to the floor and touching the cobwebs with it they immediately changed into a piece of gold tissue of beautiful workmanship while the flame of the lamps became strong and bright then presenting to the princess a golden key you will find said pyrrho a keyhole in the largest panel of the wainscot in your closet into which this key will fit unlock it very gently adieu fair princess i quit you only to avoid being suspected of having assisted you your task is done you may rest in peace you will find all that you want in the closet in your prison chamber 
then kneeling before the princess pierrot kissed her hand and quitted the gallery fairer more astonished at this adventure than at any of the previous events of the day returned to her ebony closet she was looking for the panel which pierrot had specified when she heard the sweetest voice she had ever listened to complaining in the most tender and sorrowful accents the princess fancied that the voice must belong to some unfortunate creature like herself placed in confinement to be tortured she listened therefore attentively alas what shall i do said the voice i am commanded to change this bushel of acorns into an equal quantity of oriental pearls the princess less surprised than she would have been two hours before knocked two or three times against the wainscot and said aloud if hard tasks are set within these walls miracles likewise are performed do not despair but tell me i entreat you your history and i will return your confidence by informing you of mine i am a king's daughter answered the voice and was pronounced beautiful from my birth at which however no fairies were present to assist you are i suppose aware that those capricious beings have an aversion for all that have not been under their protection from the cradle alas i know it all too well answered fairer i am a beauty like yourself and the daughter of a king i am also unfortunate because i do not owe my beauty to their gifts we are then true companions in affliction answered the invisible but are you in love it matters not said fairer to herself then she added aloud go on with your story and do not interrupt yourself to ask me questions i was universally acknowledged to be the fairest creature ever seen pursued the voice and i had many friends and suitors princes came from far and near attracted by the renown of my beauty to demand my hand in marriage i must tell you that i am called uranth among the numerous pretenders to my hand and heart one young prince was particularly as studious in his attentions i returned his affection and gave him every reason to hope for the fulfilment of his wishes our wedding day was fixed when the fairies jealous at seeing me so sought after and about to be so happy and unable to endure the thoughts of immortals being so except through themselves carried me off one day from my father's palace and conveyed to me my present wretched prison one of them has visited me to-day to tell me that i shall be strangled to-morrow morning if by that time i have not executed a ridiculous and impracticable task that they have assigned to me now inform me of who you are i shall have told you nearly all answered the princess when i shall have told you my name i am called fairer than a fairy then you are then very very fair replied the princess uranth i have a great desire to see you that i am equally anxious to see you too returned fairer is there not a door somewhere about here for i have a little key which may perhaps assist us to satisfy our mutual curiosity looking narrowly about our princess discovered a small keyhole to which she applied the little golden key and succeeded in unlocking the door having pushed it open the two princesses eyes met and each was much surprised by the wonderful beauty of the other when their embraces and congratulations were over fairer could not forbear laughing to observe that uranth had been very busily employed in rubbing her acorns with a little white stone as she had been commanded she then informed her new friend of the task that had been given to her and that the most charming person she had ever seen had wrought a miracle in her favour but who could it be said uranth i think it was a young man answered fairer a young man cried uranth ah you blush you are in love with him no not yet answered our princess but he told me that he is in love with me and if he really loves me as he said he did he will come to your assistance scarcely had fairer pronounced these words when the acorns and the bushel began to move and continued moving without any apparent cause for some time when they were suddenly changed into large pear-shaped pearls of the first quality far superior indeed to that of the pearl which queen cleopatra dissolved in the cup she presented at the celebrated banquet to mark antony our two princesses were agreeably surprised by this adventure and fairer who began to grow accustomed to such prodigies taking uranth by the hand they repassed into her ebony closet fairer immediately resumed her search for the panel mentioned by piero which she soon discovered and applying her little golden key thereto unlocked it and pushed open the panel entered an apartment of which the magnificent surprise and affected her because she recognized in all she saw marks of her lover's thoughtfulness the floor was strewn with violets and other sweet-smelling flowers which exhaled the most fragrant perfume and in the centre of this delightful room stood a table 
on which was laid out a most sumptuous entertainment consisting of rare and delicate viands while in different parts of the table with little fountains of wine and lemonade flowing into basins of green porphyry the young princesses seated themselves unhastingly in two chairs of ivory enriched with emeralds and ate of this noble feast with good appetite the repast finished the table disappeared and was replaced by a most deliciously perfumed bath in which having indulged for some time it vanished and made way for a superb toilet a large basket of gold wire filled with linen so white that it was a luxury to look on it a bed curiously shaped but gorgeously furnished stood at one end of this remarkable apartment which was bordered by orange trees in full flower growing in vases set with emeralds and rubies while columns of cornelian disposed at regular distances supported the golden ceiling and between each pillar was a splendid crystal mirror which reached from the cornice to the floor princess Euranth, admiring her companion's good fortune said to her your lover is as powerful as he is deeply enamoured and apparently neglects nothing to gratify your wishes yours is not common fate a musical clock which stood in the room now sounded midnight by repeating twelve times the name of pyrrho fairer blushed threw herself on her bed and tried to sleep but her repose was interrupted by the image of her lover when the morrow came the court of the queen of the fairies was thrown into the utmost astonishment at beholding the gallery perfectly freed from cobwebs and at sight of the bushel of pearls while they found each of the princesses quietly seated in her prison chamber having assembled in council to determine what task should next be given to the objects of their hatred the fairies commanded Euranth to go to the seashore and write on the sand taking especial care that what she wrote should not be effaced by the waves while fairer received orders to go to the foot of the sugar-loaf mountain to ascend to its summit and to bring thence to them a vase filled with the water of immortality as there was no means of reaching the top of this mountain without flying they gave the princess feathers and wax hoping that like an other icarus she would make herself wings and thereby cause her destruction Euranth and fairer sighed on the hearing these commands and having tenderly embraced they separated as sorrowfully as though they were certain they would never see each other again Euranth was then conducted to the seashore and fairer to the foot of sugarloaf mountain arrived at her destination fairer took the feathers and wax and vainly attempted to construct something with them in the shape of wings but after a dozen unsuccessful attempts her thoughts began to wander to pyrrho if he really loved me she said he would come again to my assistance the word assistance had scarcely passed her lips when pyrrho appeared before her looking a thousand times more handsome than on the preceding night daylight was in truth singularly favourable to him do you doubt the strength of my passion said he is there anything too difficult for me to perform in token of my love pyrrho then requested fairer to take off her slippers in which she would not be permitted to approach the fountain of immortality and suddenly transformed himself into an eagle the princess could not repress a slight feeling of regret at beholding pyrrho's charming person so metamorphosed but the eagle crouching at her feet and unfolding his wings soon made her comprehend his object she seated herself on his back twining her fair arms around his majestic neck and he gently rose into the air it would be no easy matter to pronounce which was the most delighted fairer at escaping death and executing the cruel order she had received from the fairies or pyrrho at being charged with so precious a burden the eagle carried the princess gently and safely to the summit of the mountain where she heard the agreeable concert of a thousand winged songsters who came to do homage to the illustrious bird which had borne her thither on the very top of sugarloaf mountain was a flowery plain surrounded by groves of tall cedar trees and from the centre of this plain arose a little rivulet whose silvery waters meandered over a fine sand composed of gold dust and sea diamonds fairer kneeling on the bank took some of the precious water in her hand and tasted it she then filled her vase and turning toward to her eagle ah said she how happy should i be could my friend Euranthe drink of this water the words had scarcely passed her lips when the eagle flew to the foot of the mountain seized one of fairer's slippers and returning with it to the stream filled it and flew away to the beach on whose sands the princess Euranthe was vainly endeavouring to write in indelible characters his mission fulfilled the eagle returned to fairer who reseated herself on his back 
and expressed a wish to join her dear friend. Piero, to whom her slightest wish was law, instantly directed his flight toward the beach, where Euranthe was still occupied with her fruitless labor, the waves and facing whatever she wrote as soon as it was completed. What barbarity, said the princess to Fairer when she saw her, to command me to achieve the impossibility, but I guess from your singular mode of travelling that you have succeeded in obtaining what was required of you? Fairer having alighted, and being moved by the sight of her friend's affliction, turned to her lover and said, Show me yet another and more convincing proof of your power. Or rather of my love, interrupted the prince, and without giving his mistress time to finish her request, he resumed his natural shape. When Euranthe saw the beauty of his face, in person, surprise and pleasure sparkled in her eyes, while Fairer blushed, yet, by an involuntary movement, turned her face on her lover to conceal her agitation from her friend. Do as I bid you, she said, with playful petulance. Piero saw that he was loved, and willing to put an end to her anxiety, desired her to read what she would find written on the sand, and disappeared more quickly than a flash of lightning. At the moment of Piero's disappearance, a wave rolled to Ferrer's feet, and, then retiring, discovered a brazen tablet as firmly sunk in the sand as though it had been there from the creation of the world, and to all appearance immovable. The princesses regarded it with wonder, and while still looking at it, an invisible hand engraved thereon the deep letters of the following stanzas. Vulgar lovers, oath and vows, are like letters traced in sand. The lightest wave that o'er them flows leaves a bare and noteless strand. But the love your charms inspire, princess, fairer than a fay, is graven deep in words of fire on a heart that woos thy sway. I understand, cried Euranth. These lines are addressed to you by your lover. Oh, may his passion be as lasting as it is tenderly expressed. The princess then embraced Fairer, who was quite overcome by the tenderness of her friend's caresses and the confusion she could not but feel at the recollection of her unfounded jealousy. But, having made a full confession to her friend, she soon recovered to indulge in the pleasure of an agreeable and confidential conversation. In the meantime, Queen Dwarfina, having sent to the foot of the Sugarloaf Mountain to inform herself of what had befallen Fairer, her messenger, finding feathers scattered in all directions, and not seeing the princess, brought word to her that Fairer had perished, and that the fairies had succeeded in their object. When they heard this, the fairies hastened to the beach, but shrieked with surprise when they saw that the graven tablet on the sands, and were desperate with malice when they discovered the two princesses amusing themselves under the shade of a rock. Fairer could not help smiling at the astonishment of the fairy queen when she presented to her the water of immortality which did not appear to be estimated as its value on the occasion. Dorfina, however, was not a person to be laughed at, and although at a no loss to discover that an art as powerful as her own had assisted the princesses, she yet resolved to accomplish their total ruin on the morrow. Euranth was accordingly ordered to go to the fairy land arcade, and there procure the elixir of perpetual youth and beauty, while Fairer was to repair to the forest of marvels and catch the silver-footed hind, Princess Euranth was conducted to an extensive plain, in the midst of which stood a prodigiously high and capacious marble building, the interior of which was divided into halls and arcades, filled with shops, in which jewelry, perfumes, and fancy articles of all kinds, and from all parts of the world, were so tastefully set out that no words can convey an idea of their superb effect. Each of these shops was kept by young and lovely fairies who were assisted in their business by the persons whom they loved best. The moment Euranth entered this gorgeous building, her youth and beauty charmed all the fairies, and she excited the most tender interest when, at the first shop she came to, she asked for the elixir of perpetual youth and beauty. They dared not inform her where it was to be found, as they knew when this precious elixir was demanded that the mortal charged with the dangerous commission was intended for punishment by their queen. At last, Euranth's evil star conducted her to the shop of a wicked fairy, who, directly, our princess asked, in the name of the queen of the fairies, for the elixir of perpetual youth and beauty, answered that she could procure it for her for the next day, at the same time desiring Euranth to step into an adjoining room and rest herself while it was being prepared. No sooner, however, had the unfortunate princess crossed the threshold than the door was closed behind her, and she found herself in a dark and noisome dungeon. Terror seized upon her, and she called in her fear, 
on the amiable lover of fairer than a fairy to assist her ere she perished alas he was either deaf to her voice or unable to comply with her request in this distress she tormented herself throughout the night and it was already morning when she fell into an uneasy slumber she was shortly awakened by a neatly dressed damsel who brought her some refreshment the girl informed eranth that she was sent by her mistress his favorite who was determined at all hazards to assist her adding that the fairy had sent for an evil genius to enable her to charge eranth's beauty into ugliness that she might send her deformed and overwhelmed with disgrace back to the queen of the fairies poor eranth was dreadfully terrified at this communication convinced that a miracle alone could save her from being deprived of all of her charms she was walking about her dungeon in the most wretched state of mind when she felt herself suddenly seized by the arm oh how her heart beat with fear the hand however led her gently to a corner where a few rays of light penetrated through a small opening and when your aunt had courage to look up she was indeed agreeably surprised for she beheld by her side the prince her lover for whom she had been torn away just as they fixed upon their wedding day and is it really you she cried repeatedly until at last convinced of her lover's identity and mindful of her present misery she said but are you the favorite of the malicious fairy and do i behold you with the claim of that fine title doubt it not answered her lover it is to that favor that we shall owe the termination of our misfortunes the prince then related to eranth that in despair at her loss he had consulted a hermit as to where she then was that the old man had told him that when he next saw her it would be in fairyland and had given him the means of finding her he was however stopped in his search by the malicious old fairy who had conceived a passion for him in pursuance of my adviser's instructions continued the prince i did not entirely repulse her and by my duplicity i gained a complete ascendancy over her mind became the master of her treasures and the minister of her will my ancient inamorata has just set out on a journey of eighteen thousand miles and will not return for a fortnight we must make the best use of this opportunity for effecting our escape i know where the fairy keeps her invisible ring and will go and fetch it you shall put it on and will thus be able to quit our dungeon unperceived i can leave the arcade openly do not forget said Duranth, the elixir of perpetual youth and beauty i would drink of it myself and give some to a dear friend of mine the prince laughed and where shall we go asked Duranth. to the queen of the fairies replied her lover no not there said the princess we shall be put to death the sage who protects me pursued he counsels me to conduct you to the place whence you were brought if i would ensure my happiness and he has never yet deceived me be it so said Duranth. let us depart immediately Orontes, so was Urant's lover called, hinted to his mistress a china flagon, which contained the elixir of perpetual youth and beauty. Anxious to appear more lovely in the prince's eyes, she drank deeply of it, forgetting that the ring which she wore on her finger rendered her invisible. Then, taking Orontes' arm and carrying the flagon in her hand, she traversed thus the whole of the arcade and reached the fairy queen's palace with her lover. Arrived there, Urianth pulled off the invisible ring and gave it to Orontes. Then the lovely princess became visible to her lover, who, to her great regret, made himself invisible in his turn by putting on the ring, and they then entered Dorfina's palace. The fairies looked at each other in the utmost astonishment when they beheld Urianth enter with a flagon of elixir. Dorfina, lowering her brow, said, Let the insolent be put into close confinement. I see that our stratagems produce no effect and she must be put to death without any further trouble. Euranth trembled violently when she heard this cruel speech, but Orontes, who was still by her side, bade her be of good cheer. We will now turn to Fairer than a fairy, who was conducted to the forests of marvels, and state why she was commanded to take the silver-footed hind, and what was her success. There had been formerly a queen of the fairies who had attained justly that noble distinction. She was fair, amiable, and learned, and had many lovers whose attentions however were thrown away upon her occupied as she ever was in protecting virtue she could not find time for listening to the sighs of her admirers of her numerous suitors there was one whom her indifference rendered peculiarly miserable and it will naturally be inferred that he was the one who was most ardent in his passion for the queen 
one day his entreaties being still unable to move her he protested in his despair that he would kill himself to this threat she paid no attention regarding it as the mere bombast so frequently employed by lovers in their threats to their mistresses end of which they are far from ever intending to fulfil however she was informed shortly after that he had thrown himself into the sea an old hermit under whose care the unfortunate youth had been educated and who was deeply skilled in magic obtained of the celestial influences which have power over fairies and over men that the chaste queen should pass the next hundred years of her life under the form of a hind as an expiation of her cruelty and that she could only be redeemed from this form by an elegant and beautiful young lady who exposing herself for six days in the forest of marvels and chase of her should having caught her be willing to restore her natural shape shortly after her metamorphosis several princesses had risked their beautiful persons in the forest attracted by an adventure which seemed to promise so much glory each of course fancied at starting that she was destined to be the most successful huntress but each was successfully lost in the intricacies of the thicket and heard of no more so that after a time the ardour of ladies in pursuit of the hind cooled and she was hunted only by persons whom the fairies condemned to the task with a certainty that it would terminate in their destruction it was accordingly to rid themselves of fairer that the fairies sent her to the forest of marvels a little food in a basket was given to her for form's sake and a silken halter was put in her hand to throw over the hind's neck behold her then equipped for her hunting expedition in the forest forty years after the metamorphosis of the fairy queen fairer left to herself put her little basket of provisions at the foot of a tree and looked sorrowfully around her in whichever direction she turned the vast forest slept in profound silence and not an object but trees turf and sky presented itself in her sight she was determined to remain on the border of the forest and not to attempt to penetrate its depths with this view she resolved to take an exact survey of the immediate neighbourhood on the spot on which she then stood but alas in that forest it was impossible to move a step without losing her way and when she attempted to return to the tree she was completely at fault suddenly she found herself within a short distance of the silver-footed hind who was walking leisurely up an avenue fairer immediately ran toward it with her halter in hand to catch it at once but the hind darted off, stopping from time to time and turning round to contemplate her pursuer. The princess continued to chase the hind in this manner the whole of the first day until night set in and hid it from her sight. The poor huntress then found herself both weary and hungry, but she was unable to find the place where she had left her little basket of food, and as for repose, she could not expect much of that on the hard ground she stretched herself despairingly under a spreading tree but scarcely closed her eyes the least noise even a leaf falling into the ground making her shudder with fear in this miserable condition her thoughts naturally wandered to her lover upon whom she called many times and when she found that he came not to her in this great emergency alas she said pyrrho pyrrho and have you abandoned me her tears began to flow and she had nearly cried herself to sleep when she felt something move under her and the ground now felt so soft that she could have fancied she was lying on the finest bed in the world she was awakened in the morning from a long and untroubled sleep by an agreeable concert of innumerable nightingales when looking round her she observed that the grass all about where she was lying had grown in the night so as to have become a most delightfully verdant couch a large orange tree spread its branches over her forming a kind of canopy to her bed which was strewed with its blossoms two turtle doves cooing in a bush hard by reminded fairer of her pyrrho's affection strawberries and various other kinds of excellent fruit were growing in profusion near her couch of which the princess ate heartily and felt as refreshed as if she had partaken of the choicest viands when she had satisfied her appetite oh attentive pyrrho she exclaimed but for your timely assistance i must have perished i no longer murmur at my hard fate and only wish to see you to make me quite contented fairer would have continued her soliloquy but at the moment she observed the silver-footed hand resting on its haunches and quietly watching her she made sure of it taking its time and having gathered a handful of grass offered it to the hind 
holding her silken halter in the other hand, but the hind skipped onward, and when it had run a little distance from the princess resumed its sitting posture, and gazed earnestly on its fair pursuer. The princess passed the whole of the second day in fruitless attempts to catch it, and when night set in, passed it as she had passed the preceding. On the third morning, she was awakened as before, and the following days and nights were spent in the same way. At last, on the fifth morning, when Farah opened her eyes, she fancied it was lighter than usual, and, on looking up, perceived her lover his eyes sparkling with all the love she inspired. He was kneeling near her and kissing her feet. Pleased by his presence and gratified by his respectful attention, "'You are come, then, at last,' said Farer. "'But though I have not seen you latterly, "'I have, at least, experienced marks of her goodness.' "'Say rather of my love, Fairer than a fairy,' interrupted Piero. "'My mother suspects I assist you and has placed me in confinement, "'from which I have only escaped for a few moments "'by the assistance of the kind fairy and my friend. "'I have only time to assure you of my eternal fidelity "'and to add that you will see me again this evening.' If fortune favors us tomorrow, we shall be happy. Adieu. Piero disappeared, and the silver-footed hind appeared. The princess went in chase of it. When the fifth night came, she perceived, very near to her, a small bright flame, which sufficed to discover her lover. Here is my fiery wand, said he. Place it before you, and follow unhesitatingly wherever it shall lead you. When it stops, you will discover, by its light, a heap of dry leaves. Set fire to the leaves, and fearlessly enter the opening you will then perceive. If you there find the skin of an animal, which you recognize, burn it. The stars, our friends, will take care of the rest. Adieu. Fairer would have been glad to receive more ample instructions, but her lover was gone. So she unhesitatingly placed the wand before her, and followed where it led. It went on before her for more than two hours, and she began to grow very tired. When it stopped, and by its light, Farah perceived the heap of dry leaves, to which she immediately set light. The leaves instantly threw up a bright blaze, and discovered a high mountain, with an opening toward its base, nearly concealed by brambles. The princess pushed them aside with her wand, and entered the mouth of the opening. She found herself in total darkness, but, walking forward, presently came to a large and noble hall, handsomely furnished, and brilliantly lighted with many chandeliers. But what struck her with most astonishment was to perceive the skins of several wild beasts suspended from golden hooks, which she took at first for the beasts themselves. She gazed on them for some time with fear, when, averting her eyes, she perceived in the middle of the hall a fine tall palm tree, from a branch of which was hanging the skin of the silver-footed hind. Fairer was delighted at the sight. She took the skin on the end of her wand and carried it to the fire she had lighted at the mouth of the grotto. The flames immediately consumed it, and the princess returned joyfully to the hall, and penetrated into a long suit of magnificent apartments. She stepped into one, in which she saw several little beds arranged on a Persian carpet, one of them being of richer materials than the others, and placed under a pavilion of cloth of gold. But she had no time to reflect on the singularity of what she saw, for she suddenly heard loud peals of laughter, and a confused and loud noise of several voices. Fairer, turning her steps in the direction of these sounds, entered into a wonderful apartment, in which were seated fifteen young persons of divine beauty. They rose at her entrance, apparently as much surprised at the appearance of the princess as was she at beholding them. The extreme loveliness of her person, too, charmed them all. In attentive silence, Having succeeded the cries of admiration which burst from them at first, one of the fair fifteen, more beautiful than her companions, advanced with a gay and smiling countenance to meet our charming princess. I cannot doubt, she said, that you are my deliverer, as no one ever enters here who is not clothed in the skin of an animal such as you saw suspended in the hall. It has been the fate of all the lovely persons you see around me. After ten days unsuccessfully spent in hunting me, they have all been changed into animals like myself, excepting that during the night we all resume our natural shapes. You, fair princess, but that you were destined to effect my deliverance, would have been transformed into a white rabbit. A white rabbit? cried Fairer. Oh, madame, I am very happy to have preserved my former form 
and to have dischanted so charming a person as you appear to be. Yes, you have restored us all to liberty, answered the fairy. Let us pass the remainder of this night together, and tomorrow we will repair to my palace to fill all the court with joy and astonishment. No pen could do justice to the gaiety of which that charming abode was on that night, the witness, or to the ecstasies of the fair inmates about to be restored to life, so to speak. They were all of them the same age as on the day they commenced their hunting expedition in the Forest of Marvels, and the eldest of them was not yet twenty. When the queen was inclined to repose, she invited Fairer to share her bed, and expressed a wish to know her history. The princess related it so affectingly, yet in such artless and truthful expressions, that the fairy resolved from that moment to take her under her protection, and to crown her and her faithful Pierrot's affection with lasting happiness. Fairer did not forget her friend Euranthe, for whom the fairy conceived an almost equal affection. After a lengthy conversation which they frequently interrupted by assurances of eternal friendship, the fairy and the princess fell into profound sleep. The next day they all set out for the palace, intending agreeably to surprise the fairies. They quitted without regret the forest of marvels, and in due time reached their destination. As they approached the outer court, their ears were saluted by an agreeable concert, which seemed to proceed from the full and skilful military band. When they entered the quadrangle, it was crowded by an immense concourse of people. We come in the very nick of time, said the fairy. This must be some holiday. Let us see what is doing. The fairy cleared the passage through the throng and passed on with her troop. Directly she was recognized. Loud shouts rent the air, and great was the universal joy at her return. But continuing to move onward, a strange sight met her eyes. A young maiden, more charming than the grass, and as beautiful as Venus, was tied to a stake, and was apparently about to be burned. Fairer immediately recognized her friend Euranthe. She uttered a piercing shriek, but her terror and surprise even redoubled when in that moment her friend vanished, and in her place appeared a young man, so handsome that he immediately attracted the looks of all present. Fairer rushed to the spot where the youth was bound, threw herself on his neck, and bursting into tears, exclaimed, "'It is my brother! It is my brother!' It was so indeed her brother, who was also the favored lover of Euranthe, and who, fearing that she would be put to death, had given her the invisible ring to enable her to escape from the fate which the cruel Dorfina had prepared for her. The brother and sister embraced again and again, and their affectionate caresses were shared by the invisible Euranthe, whose voice was audible while her person could not be seen. In the meanwhile, the fairies present, astonished beyond measure at these extraordinary events, manifested the utmost joy at the return of their good queen and throwing themselves at her feet kissed her hands and the border of her robe some became speechless with astonishment some wept for joy while others laughed hysterically the wicked fairies or partisans of dwarfina also affected to welcome her return with eagerness and their policy gave an air of sincerity to their false demonstrations dwarfina herself furious at her virtuous predecessor's return concealed her real feelings with an art of which she alone was capable she at once professed her readiness to abdicate in favour of her rightful queen who with a grave and majestic air demanded in what way the young lady she had just seen had merited the punishment about to have been inflicted and how long it had become customary to solemnize a cruel death by feats and rejoicings dwarfina made a very clumsy excuse to which the queen was impatiently listening but Orontes interrupted her, saying, May it please your majesty, the princess was about to be punished for being so lovely. The princess, my sister, has likewise suffered much for the same cause. Behold both the culprits, and judge how guilty they are from their looks. And Orontes requested Euranthe to pull off her ring, which done, she immediately became visible, her beauty charming all beholders. They are, as you see, beautiful, pursued Orontes and they are also possessed of a thousand amiable qualities which they do not derive from the fairies. These are their only crimes, for these have they been so cruelly persecuted. Then, turning to Dwarfina, Orontes added, How unjust have you been, madame, to abuse with a tyrannical power all beauty and virtue which do not emanate from yourself. The prince was silent. The queen turned to the assembly with a lively air and said, I demand the guardianship of these three persons, 
for I feel inclined to make them happy. I am under the deepest obligations to Fairer, and I am sure you will allow that Queen of the Fairies should never prove ungrateful. You shall still reign, madame, pursued the Queen, turning toward Dufina. This empire is large enough for both of us. To you belongs the sovereignty of the islands in which you were born, and your right shall never be questioned by me. But leave with me your son, who is a party in my plan of happiness for these mortals, and whom I destined to marry fairer than a fairy. This union will reconcile us all. Dorfina was provoked by the queen's commands, but what could she do? She was a weaker party, and had only to obey. She was consenting to this proposition with a very bad grace, when the handsome Piero made his appearance, followed by a crowd of noble youths who composed his court. He had come to pay his respects to the queen, and to congratulate her on her return, but perceiving Fairer, as he passed along, he showed by his tender looks that his first homage was paid to her. The queen, embracing Piero, presented him to Fairer than a fairy, entreating her to receive him from her hands. The prince's transports may be more easily imagined than described. Fairer, in her joy, did not forget her parents or the good governess, from whose care she had been snatched by the wiles of the artful Dwarfina. She expressed a wish, therefore, that they might approve of her choice and be present at her wedding. In a moment the queen transported the four lovers, herself and the court, to the castle, where they found the king and queen still in the deepest distress at the supposed loss of their favorite daughter and of Arantes, who had left them in search of his sister. Delighted at beholding their children once more, they were scarcely less so at perceiving them accompanied by persons so worthy of their choice as Euranth and Pyrrho, and immediately consented to their union, thanking the queen of the fairies for her favor and protection. The two marriages were solemnized on one day, and they were so happy in their results that it had been said that Pyrrho and Fairer, Orontes and Euranth, are the only two couples who ever really deserved the title of the happy, and that those who have been since cited as having gained it led the lives of dogs and cats in comparison. End of chapter 4